Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on demystifying blockchain technology. Now, the blockchain technology is a very exciting new technology, I would call it, with huge potential to disrupt our existing practices and procedures. If you look back at the evolution of technology, the inventory has, if I look at the internet, has revolutionized the way the world does business. New technologies evolved which will have major impact on many functions for decades to come. So this is what we plan to cover up in the morning session for the next one hour. And this session will be followed by some quiz. One question I also have on the survey just to know how many of you been, have been exposed to blockchain technology? Well, friend, with this, again, I welcome you. Now, the, the learning part, what we have kept for the morning session is, first thing is to understand blockchain technology. You may call blockchain technology 101. What exactly is a blockchain? I know many of you must have heard about bitcoins, but what exactly is the blockchain which is behind the bitcoin? How does it work? So we'll try to walk through that. What are the opportunities for this and what are the challenges for this? And lastly, but not the least, since being from procurement and supply chain, I will try to give some examples how this is going to impact your profession itself. So in short, if I have to summarize what I expect from each one of you, the takeaway should be, everybody should know what exactly is a blockchain, how it is going to affect your work, working environment, your processes. And then also a little bit I'll touch on the Bitcoin, while the focus is not on the Bitcoin at all. And then what are the opportunities? So but when you come to opportunity, you have to learn about the smart contract. I'll talk about the smart contract. I'll talk about the private key and the public key. How does it work? It? How does the validation happens? How does the mining happens? So those are the issues which I plan to cover up in the morning session with you. Let's look back the whole disruptive computing paradigm. 1970s were the mainframe. I came out from the college. 1970, the mainframe was very visible. I worked on those activities those days. 1980s, I was in the euro that time and PCs was there. 1990, I was there itself. And 80s itself, the internet work has started around. And 1990, I was also working on EDI standard those days. Then came 1990s, 94, 95, and it was really launched because of WWA. Internet came just for the email purpose, you all know very well. Starting was that we could share the information. The letters have gone. Instead of letters, we could send emails. The concept changed around of communication. So internet became a mode of communications. But then internet got the first layer, the first overlay, that was World Wide Web, www, which helped us to change the way we do business, whether locally or globally. So you know the e-commerce. I think it came only because of www. Then came 2000, was obviously social media, you very well know. Now we're moving into mobile concepts. And 2010, technically the workload started, the first white paper was in 2008. Then in 2009, the Bitcoin concept came, 2010. So in short, I would say the 2010, the blockchain, the whole revolutionary paradigm, the computing paradigm started around. Now, this is the second overlay, the significant overlay. So if I look at internet, the first overlay was WWW, and the second overlay is the blockchain. So it's basically a protocol. So this is how I would call it to call it on. Now, when we talk around the blockchain versus the internet itself, the first one, internet we were basically focusing on how to transfer the information. But in this case, the focus is on value. 
are we able to add the value or not? The vision is for value. So we have to keep in mind we are moving from information sharing to value. I mean, if I want to give an example around, many big companies came up in the social medias. They collect the information, which in the good old days, five or six people could sit in the garden and talk to each other. And everybody could verify this person said this, this person said this. Now from that mode, because of internet, we moved on. I could go online, send a chat to you, send a message to you. It goes to one central depository. Information is there. The data bank is there. And then from there, it goes to the other guy. So in short, then they became the mediators. So in the case of internet, I think it brought a lot of mediators. Whether it is you talk of social medias, you talk of sharing of the services like Uber and all this thing around, it brought the mediators or aggregators, you may call it out. So a lot of wealth was created, but the prosperity never came around. You and me are sharing our information on the social media. The information is great. But the person who have become the richer are the one who are maintaining the data bank, who are maintaining the site of this one around. So that I think model came around. So the data which we think is the crumbs of the bread, I talk to you, I share with you, but everything goes somewhere. And those people who are holding the data sign, they are the one which created the wealth around. Well, friend, and this is what is going to change the whole scenario. This is what the blockchain is. This is how I'm very tempted to talk about it because to me it's a total change. The concept of internet was create wealth but not the prosperity but the blockchain will help us to improve the prosperity. So this is a turnaround. Now let's understand and I'll be very happy once we leave this session. I think everybody should be very clear what exactly is a blockchain and how does it work. So blockchain is another type of a database for recording transactions. So I'm, for doing this, you may call it like a ledger. All of us are conversing with a ledger. So in the ledger you write down, I made an inquiry for this. I got the offer for this. I placed the order for this. I transferred the money for this. I got the goods on this date. Each and every information is being recorded on the ledger. Now the data in the blockchain is stored in fixed structures. In the today's internet system, when we are doing supply chain, procurement, or any activities around, they are going to one server. That might be owned by X and Y. But here, the blockchain is stored in fixed structures called blocks. So those are the blocks. And the structure of the blockchain is based on trust in single entity, but on cryptographic proof. A blockchain system has two important qualities around that namely it is decentralized. So there's no single owner. When I transfer the funds from, let's say, from one country, from India to US, or US to India, whatever we may call around, or even between the country, between one company with another company, we go through a bank. So bank is the mediator and that mediator charges you money and the mediator could become one stumbling block. It takes time. So that means the process is totally centralized and with blockchain, it becomes decentralized. So that is what you have to keep in mind. So when I say decentralized, there's no single owner. And when there is no single owner, it is immutable. You can't change it. No one can tamper with this, with the data on the blockchain. So that's the beauty of this around when, I mean, if I take an analogy, when five people are sitting in the garden talking to each other around, everybody knows who said what and this. nobody can change it. But if that information is going through a server, then being transferred to someone, then that could be tempered. That's the way it is. Let's try to understand the origin and the history of the blockchain. In 2008, all of you know, US had the financial crisis. I was there those days. 
working there. In 2008, the crisis came, and Satoshi Nakanoma, Nakamoto, this is the first anonymously, nobody knows he am so and so and Satoshi, nobody said, but this is how anonymous person first gestated and implemented the first blockchain database. And this guy developed the database as an infrastructure for the Bitcoin. Actually, nobody talked about the blockchain, it was the Bitcoin which became popular. But the foundation for the Bitcoin was blockchain database. And then blockchain database, and they created the first cryptocurrency, which is a Bitcoin. After that, many other currencies have come up. But Bitcoin was the first currency which was created. Now, Satoshi Nakamoto used the block and chain separately. He said, each and every block, I hook them together, hash them together, serialize them together in a chain. But later on this term was changed, the blockchain became one word. It is not a separate word. So block is not a separate thing, nor is the block automatically goes and parts become the chain around. So in 2014, so from blockchain 1.0 version, it came 2.0 version. And later on now we have blockchain 3 also and touch. So as you can see in the in the view, so blockchain is nothing but a peer-to-peer -peer network. So we have each one sharing each other informations around. That's how it is. The Bitcoin was the first implementation of blockchain. Actually, blockchain became popular because of Bitcoin. So when we look at the Bitcoin, it's the first application of blockchain. And the most popular one which has opened the path for using the blockchain technology for other activities as well. Now let's get beyond financial market because the Bitcoin is related to finance. Obviously there are many government who are not in favor of this because this has many other issues around so I'm not getting into the Bitcoin. But the technology part of it, it can be extended to political issues, humanitarian issues, social issues, procurement issues, supply chain issues. So it has wide, wide areas of use around. I would call this is very extreme disruptive technology, which I could really come for all activities of the society and its operation. Now the blockchain, if you look around, it can be three categories. I said to you in the beginning, blockchain 1.0, which is relating to currency and digital payments. The blockchain 2.0 is all about the contracts. So because the clock smart contracts was developed. So once we have blockchain 2, that can be applied again to our contracting areas around. Blockchain 3.0 goes beyond currency, market and finance, moves into the government, governance, moves into the health records. In one country, the health record of the whole country is in Estonia. They're keeping all centered. So one can store that around. Science, culture, all those things around. Let's look at the existing system. In the existing system, there's a person A, there's a person B making the transaction either to the bank or to the Visa card, to the MasterCard. You can see around, everybody has their own small ledgers. I did debit to so much, credit to so much, debit so much, credit so much, and the transactions are being reflected at third party. Now the question is, we all have a trust in the intermediary today. But the trust level could be less compared to the one where each one is sharing the information. Everybody knows what was said, where nobody can change the information. Nobody can tamper with the data setup. So this is the existing system. Now the problem with the current system is obviously the banks and the third party takes fees for transferring money. Mediating costs increase the transaction cost. Minimum practical transaction size is limited. Financial exchanges are low, it could take time. If you're doing one transaction from one country to another country, it could take $25, $30 per part transactions. It could take some time, maybe around a four or five days. System is opaque and lacks transparency and fairness. So this is a negative part of the current system. You can imagine around if 
this concept of blockchain is used in the banking and the finance, it could turn around the whole way we do business. Now, what could be the possible solutions? Our objective is to cut down the transaction cost, improve the speed of the transactions. Records of transaction is transparent, we want. We want visibilities around, and there's no involvement of third parties around. If I'm dealing with you, obviously in this blockchain, in the network, everybody gets the ledger part, the, the block part, but still there is, I would say, around the big security around. Nobody can change those data around. This is how I would say the trust environment, the existing trust environment on the left side, you can see organization one doing exchange of transactions. Transaction could be money, transaction could be purchase order, transaction could be supply chain, transaction could be any activities, assets, you might be selling a property, you might be buying a car, any activity, buy and sell, is a transaction. Now then you are going through a central authority through which you pass on the payments based on receipt of some document. And that centralized trusted authority could be government, could be bank, could be legal system, could be anyone, even the lawyers or someone. Now, that trust system is different. Now, here we are coming with the blockchain, there is, mediators are gone. So, basically, millions or billions of people who are connected together, we have a network. We have peer-to-peer -peer network, we have a connected scenarios around, and this is what we call distributed trust environment. So nobody can change, nobody can tamper with the data around. Let's understand in a short way again, the block versus blockchain. So block is a record, in literal sense. And if I have to say, like a notebook, each page could be a block. I write down all the transactions going from X to Y, Y to a, whatever is there, and all transactions are there. And if you put down all the pages together, it becomes a chain. It becomes like a notebook. The notebook is like a blockchain, but each page could be a block. It can hold fewer group of information, including files, other digital, all digital assets like name. is a digital asset. Address, contact information, your picture, all the data. And even if you're doing transaction, on buying, selling, all that could go under that. You buy a house, you buy a scooter, you buy a car, or you are buying something generated for the office. All those information are digital assets. So the chain is nothing but each block header has a field that references the previous block, hash key, and thus forming a contagious chain of blocks that is a strong connection to the previous blocks around. This is how it comes up around. So once the blocks are verified, I'm transferring the funds to someone, I'm buying from someone, documents have been received, and once it has been verified, it gets hooked up with the previous blocks around. So there are hashing, and then it gets connected with that. The underlying technology of the blockchain allows for streamlining the transactions, obviously increases the intermodal communications. If I look at the very high level, the blockchain is a decentralized ledger. It's a ledger. The way I showed you the existing system, there are also ledger over there, but this one is decentralized. All people hooked up together, they can see each other ledgers of all transactions across peer-to-peer -peer networks. And this is the technology underlying bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies. There are many other cryptocurrencies. And it has potential to disrupt wide range of business processes. So let me skip this one now. Now, how does this work? Now, let's say someone requests a transaction. The transaction could be, I want to buy a car, I want to buy a house, I want to buy a generator for the office. I want to buy laptops. Now the transaction is broadcast 
to the P2P network. Peer to peer. It's not procurement to pay. It's not procurement to pay. It's peer to peer network. So there are peer to network. Somebody validates it. And these validation are different nodes around. They can validate. And for validation, certainly you need a lot of computation. There are a lot of mathematical computations. And once it is verified, the block is ready to be hooked up to be hashed with the previous block. So the block gets connected. And then nobody can change it. If you and the transaction is complete. But later on, if somebody wants to make some amendment changes, all people who are in the network, they have to say yes, this change. 51% people have to accept it. So in short, it makes it very tamper-proof. By nature, I would call it's very foolproof, very secure. The cloud, the curiosity issues comes up around how to verify from where the transaction is initiated, to whom to send. How is the transaction faster than the present system? How is the currency generated around? Now the currency gets generated, those who are doing the mining part, if I'm transferring funds to someone, I might be transferring to 10 people while I may not have money. I may have $100, give $10 to one, $10 to another, and $80 to another, still I'm giving money, but somebody has to verify, do I have the funds? And these verification is done by the miners who dig into the system, they do the computation through algorithmic, and then once they do it, obviously they get some reward for that, but that reward is not as big as the bank or someone else gets the internet. So it's a very small percentage they get. That's how they create the generator. Let's walk through again. Someone requests a transaction. The request is broadcast, as I said to you. There's a validation. And the verified transaction can involve cryptocurrencies. So verified cryptocurrency comes up only when the miners works on it, they get shared of it. So this is again hooked up and the transaction is complete. Now if you keep in mind the cryptocurrency has no intrinsic values. It has got no physical form the way we have the coin of whatever 5 rupees or 10 rupees or, two, or 20 rupees note or something. We don't have those physical form at all. Its supply is not determined by a central bank and the network is completely decentralized. In a nutshell, if I have to say around, it's a shared ledger and it is ensuring security from the cryptography angle. And then we have the shared contract, the contract is shared. Today when we write the contract, contract means basically the terms and conditions. In what situation my funds will be transferred, that's what we call the contract. I'm buying something from you as a procurement person, then I say, okay, if I receive this, goods have been cleared, goods have been checked. So that contract is also a coded form. There's a consensus. So those who are in the network, peer-to-peer, -peer, are in the ones, there has to be consensus. So any change, if they have to be bring around, then there's a thing around. Here you can get a fairly good idea around centralized network. All of you know very well. Today, you and me, when we transfer the funds from one company to another company, person to person, you're going through centralized network. When you're doing social media, again, you're going through centralized network. But the decentralized means we are decentralizing. But again, if they're all connected together, it becomes distributed networks. Now the decentralization system, all of you know the traditional ledgers are very centralized. Now in the blockchain, the way you can see the four people, while well, the numbers could be millions, billions, here we're talking of just four people in the network, peer-to-peer -peer network. So they have distributed system distributed ledger. Each one is getting the ledgers so everybody can see what transaction has happened around. If somebody wants to change, the change will happen in other places also and another one can refuse it. So there has to be consensus. 
So this is how it is a distributed system and each one is called the nodes in the corner what you can see. A node can be defined as an individual processing unit in the distributed system. So those which are the processing system, they do it. Now data storage, a blockchain is just defined as I said to you in the beginning. What data will go and how database will be structured, the rows, the column, the tables, I think those who are aware of the data structure, they can they will understand better. Can think of a blockchain competing most closely with the database. As I said to you in the beginning, the blocks in a chain are equal to the pages in a book. So like in a book, notebook or any book, each page is like a block. Now in between when we are saying that I'm creating a block and the block is hooked up with the previous block, so there are public key and the private key. So when you make a transaction over the blockchain, you are actually sending a hashed version, what is known as a public key. And there's another key which is hidden from them that is known as a private key. And this private key is the one who's transferring the assets around, or transactions around. This private key is used to derive the public key, as you can see in the pictorial part. So private key is used to generate a signature, digital signature, so it becomes to confirm that the transaction has come from the user. So this cannot be altered at all. So there are private keys and the public keys are not. I hope this one has made you very clear what is the blockchain, what is block, and then also got the idea about the public and the private key, which does the encrypting part, encrypting part. Now let's understand the smart contract. Now the smart contracts, first understand what is a contract. You all know very well, those who are from procurement and supply chain. We write down our conditions, terms, conditions. 15 pages, terms and conditions. You will do this, you will do this, I will do this. And once you do this, I will transfer the fund. At the end of the day, the funds have to be transferred. And the goods have to be delivered to you. Our services have to be delivered to you. Now those things, I'm trying to convert them, again these are like a computer protocols, I can codify those activities. First activity I can codify around that you will send us the documents, the document will be sent to us, if I'm doing like a consulting work, report will be sent, somebody will say report okay. So in the coding system automatically this activity's tick mark is complete. Then there are milestones around when the payment has to be delivered. Computer knows that after it is complete, within 15 days or 30 days the payment has to be processed. So the coding helps you to again process the payment as well. They usually have a user interface and can emulate the logic of contractual clauses. So all the clauses which goes into the contract, what is the logic you can put them into coded form. Take again the example here, smart contract is connected between two users, two companies, two players, buyer and seller. The terms in the contracts are written as a code. The smart contract is placed in a blockchain. So all triggering events, events could be receipt of document, receipt of reports, this event could be that a report has been cleared, the smart contract execute itself. If I take around in a very simple example, like you and me go to the vending machine. Normally we go to the department store, I pay the money, buy a cold drinks, let's buy it, checks it, okay, I receive the money, then I lift the cold drinks. Same thing, the vending machine does it. So with the vending machine also you have a contract that you put down one dollar coin and your bottle you can pick it up. So that whole thing has been coded there and you can do it. So contract which might be very complex, you can put down various events and each event can be coded. And once all the events are complete, funds could be transferred. So this is how it is there, but the code is nothing but is a combination of 0, 1, 0, 1, all that codes are there around. Let's get down to the smart contracts. Current paper-based system is driving nearly 20 trillions of transactions per year. 
Now, consensus protocols are key to determining the sequence of actions. You can imagine the scope of work around. So much funds are being transferred, whether for procurement activity, for financial activities, supply chain, whatever activities around. At the end of the day, every activity leads to transfer of funds. Even if you're doing hotel booking, you're doing room booking, you're doing airline booking, everything leads to a contract, and contracts mean when you get the ticket, payment has to be made. If you compare the traditional contracts, it takes a longer cycle, it takes minutes, smart contracts. And if you look around the remittance part, it takes manual remittance, automatic remittance is an arm. Escrow is necessary. In the past, when we were doing software, somebody developed the software and said, guys, this will be kept with escrow. So escrow may not be necessary nowadays. It's very expensive, the traditional system. It's a fraction of the cost. So it's a virtual presence. So it's a smart contract, certainly outweighs the traditional contracts. The advantage is the way I look from the smart contract. It's eliminate the need of any intermediary like a broker, lawyer, and thus saves cost. All the documents are encrypted in a blockchain. So whatever goes into the blockchain after verification, they're all encrypted. So once it is encrypted, so by nature it becomes more secure. Usually a user has to spend lots of time for paperwork or to manually process the document. Smart contracts can automate the whole process, thereby saving time and money also. These are executed in an automated manner. Now the opportunity is what we are getting from this smart contract. A long term contract, let's say I made a contract with the company, the guys, they say they'll give you a discount. If you buy within a year 20,000 laptops, we'll give you a discount of 15%. If you buy 5,000, we'll give you 10%. So my discount is linked with numbers. How much I'm going to do? Today what I do around is I buy this month 200 pieces, next month 5,000, 500 pieces. My discount is decided only at the end of the year, end of the six month. Now that takes a lot of time, calculations. Here the computer, the smart contract can do its self computation, how much has been done and can build in the discount based on the numbers, based on the volume and you get your discount. So technically if I fantasize I had a blockchain solution with the supplier, check will show up on your account one day with no further efforts. You don't have to go and call the guy, oh this year I sold so much, your level threshold was this much, you should give me this rebate, back and forth, a lot of emails and messages around. So smart contract can track our consumption, authorize the payments, execute the transaction, what a world will be. I think the world will be totally different. Now coming back with other applications around, I'll take a few examples which have been implemented already in the blockchain. E-commerce is one, global payments are another one, remittances, peer-to-peer -peer lending, microfinance, healthcare, this is becoming very popular and some companies in India are also working on the healthcare side, the title records, I've seen some countries. Latin America, so they're trying to put the land records through the blockchain. So nobody can change, nobody can tamper it. Ownership, voting, intellectual properties, particularly when you're doing today intellectual properties, I think this is blockchain is a wonderful tool for that. So in short, if I had to summarize the other cross-industry application, consumer products, manufacturing, Technologies, media, telecom, healthcare, life science. Now, if you look at this application where it has been used, this is where I've taken a few. Obviously, the NASDAQ is using it to help firms manage here. Estonia, which is a Baltic nation next to Sweden, very close to Sweden, is securely storing the healthcare record. Somebody said, oh, We are already storing it. But today, when the healthcare records are stored, they can be sold off, they can be easily dispensed with, somebody can change it. But once the blockchain, nobody can change it. 
until you authorize with your private key, nobody can access it. They are available, I'm not questioning, in the chain, but until you authorize with a private key, nobody else can see. So it gives you much more secure data. And uh, Estonia population is around a, around a close to few millions, but then they have for one million people already citizens. Japanese airline is allowing even the use of cryptocurrency as payment for flights. What does it mean? On the intellectual property, certainly it has a big headway. Let's say in the good old days when we look back when the internet was not there, I write a song, nobody can use it until they pay me the royalty for this. And the day internet came around, everybody could copy and everybody could send it. The guy, the poor guy who has worked the hard, doesn't get anything. While now if the blockchain comes up, the blockchain could become a business itself. I put my music, I put my song, I could make it again a business criteria, smart contracts around. If you do this, if you use for phone, mobile phone or something, then this is the cost. So you pay for it and you get the payment. So the payment also is assured. So it is, I think, going to help those people who are dealing with intellectual property as well, particularly the music and other areas around. The, the promise which I look around, it is the same way what happened in 1990s. In India, we brought the internet in 95. US, I know, in the White House was 93 and 94. When it was launched officially, the internet was first used for email, as all of you know, but later on expanded to many. The Bitcoin was the first application, and I think everybody links the Bitcoin with the blockchain. They think the Bitcoin came first and blockchain came later. No. The blockchain came late first, and Bitcoin was an application of that, the first application. Now that application, I can understand there are many restrictions, there are many issues, because there are not many regulatory things around, so many government have not supported this still. But excitement still surrounds the technology part, because there are many potential uses which are being identified. And I'm very confident for next few decades, the blockchain will change the business operation drastically. Now the, cha the challenge which we have with the blockchain is, the first thing is a very new technology. People have faith or not faith. Same thing happened when we used to send in the good old age email. We used to call the guy also, have you received my email even after sending it? I remember those days when I was in Copenhagen, even after sending, we'll ask the guy around. So it's a new technology, new things, new risks around, but I'm sure potential is big. The biggest another problem is the regulatory status. Now the blockchain is an open source. I can create my own protocol. Someone else got develops their own protocol, then protocol to protocol may not speak to each other. So you may have not the protocol, the blockchain, you have many blockchains around. So they may not be speaking to each other. So we need to have regulatory status. So that's the one which is still missing. And particularly when you're doing the mining part, for cryptocurrencies around, it takes a lot of energy consumption. And the, some people are doing the mining on the clouds by leasing somewhere. Control, security, privacy, integration concerns are there. Culturally adopting around. I mean, this becomes purely, purely digital. The moment we move into the blockchain, every activity is digital. I know in India we are struggling around to become digital. In procurement we are trying, although we are the procurement is still a laggard, I would say, there are a lot of paper intensive, labor intensive. And the focus is to become more, move towards digitalization. We have done digitization, but not digitalization. So that's where I think we are focusing on. And once the blockchain come, it automatically moves from today's society to become 100% digital. I mean, the good things I look around, there are challenges, but the good thing I look around is that if I'm looking from the supply chain angle, 
I get the visibility of the chain in the blockchain. End to end, everybody is connected. Any supply chain you look around, there are 15, 20 players in between. So, but all those 20 players, if they're connected through peer-to-peer, -peer, other networks around, everybody knows what has been done in the beginning. Let's say my medicines are coming from one bulk drugs guy who's importing the bulk drugs, converting the bulk drugs. Now the report of the bulk drugs is available online. Converting into the medicine, again available online, till it reaches the customer. And as a customer, I'm also part of the network. The whole network around, decentralized network. And so I can easily look around all the data, sir. Where the medicines came from, where it came, when it was made, when it was packed, what is the batch number. So basically, I can trace and track it. Similarly, if I'm looking for the organic food, organic milk, organic this, I can track and trace the complete chain. Nobody can tamper it. So there is visibility, product provenance. So product, I can track and trace the whole batch, particularly when I look at the medical and organic asset. Dispute resolution, there are a few issues around, which can be resolved because we are connected well. But still, I think the regulatory part has to come up. Now let's get back to the supply chain. All of us know supply chain is complex. As a consultant for supply chain, I've worked with many companies. Some supply chains are very simple, but some supply chain has got, if they are particularly importing from one country and then exporting to another country, I find 25, 30 players in between. And how do we change the whole architect of the supply chain? Many players are around. And in that, it costs you money, speed is slow, and quality could hamper. The transparency is lacking. I'm buying goods, let's say, in X country or Y country, and they are bought from another contractor. The whole chain, I don't know what price they paid, what this they paid, I have no data set. What quality it was, or the quality was later on changed, I have no transparency around. Now, the blockchain application can counter these inefficiencies, which we have in the chain, and add new values. Blockchain leverages the technologies of decentralized cloud database, which records data on non-changeable blocks. The blocks cannot be changed, cannot be tampered. Look at the game supply chain the use case. Many companies have come up around. One of them is Provenance. And this company, which is working on the blockchain, is building traceability systems. Isro is also working on alternative platform for lending into global supply chains, school chains. So there are many companies are working on this who are focusing a lot on the blockchain. So these companies are already there, who are working on it. Let's look at one end-to-end -end supply chain. I'll take up two examples. So one, I'm looking for, let's say I want to buy generators at the end of the day. So there's a supply. As you know, in today's world, when we are becoming very, we are not a vertically integrated, we are horizontally integrated. I have my design of a generator, but I don't make it. Somebody else makes for me. I get it, I check the quality and pack it and sell it. So there's a supplier. So there's a producer who's just doing packaging and quality control. Then it is going to the distributors. And the distributor is passing on to the 3 p.m. And 3PL is going to the retailer, and the retailer has got their own store. And from store, the customer is picking it. That's the chain. I've taken a one typical supply chain. Now, the moment the company, which might be abroad, maybe anywhere, let's say I might be getting from China the generators, but I'm controlling here and putting my brand on it. It could happen with many products, as you know. Somebody is uploading the data on the generators. Generator is tagged with an RFID at the source. And when I'm doing the packing part of it, since it is my brand, I'm a producer for say on paper, gets info on generator performance test because I test the generators. 
I put the information on it, add the QR codes to packaging. Then I pass on to the distributors who automatically receive the notification about the seat of a generator. Now all of them are connected in the network. Every information is passed on to each one. Nobody can play with information. Nobody can tamper with information. So what is coming from supplier, the RFID code, nobody can tamper it. Add QR code on the packaging. So on the packaging, I put the QR code, distributors, automatically receives and the seat of generator chooses the suitable 3 pl now he says okay guys i have to send these goods to this place this place they pick up the 3 pl who can cover is in the south north east west they have their own 3 pl they take care of it now 3 pl is informed about the origin from where it is coming and destination of the generators reviews instrument instructions on how to store products optimize the network flows the 3PL also is part of the network. They also know who is the customer. So everyone knows. There's a very clear transparency. Even the customer knows who is the guy who made it, who is the producer, who is the distributor, who is the 3PL. Now it's going to the retailer. So retailer may have some spare parts, the way it is shown in the icon. And generator runs machines, learning based forecasting. So machine learning based forecasting. So technically I'm talking of artificial intelligence. So this guy is doing the forecasting. That this is the one closely connected with the customer. So they're also doing the forecasting and the forecasting is not a static forecasting, it's a dynamic forecasting. And dynamic means we're using AI artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence means we're using machine learning based language around provides app for the end users, has full transparencies, adopts orders and trials accordingly. And the last customer, customer also scan key, I'm getting the same product, QR code via app. The moment I scan it, I get all the information about the generator. Ans point, if you know in the Western world, there's a loyalty programs around for everything. If customer is buying on a regular basis, they get the loyalty program. So you can take this rough ideas around for many supply chain. Now when we're trying to implement the blockchain integrations, now one request I have got around is don't integrate them one time. As in the good old days when ERP came around, some people said don't implement with a big bang. Do in a piecemeal, do it on a pilot basis. Some did on ERP, I remember my time when I implemented with a big bang. But here, normally our advice is, when you want to integrate blockchain, because a new concept, new technologies, do it in two or three steps now. The first step could be like stored and this one is connected together. Then next could be the, the one who is giving you the distribution, the 3PL is connected with this. And then the third step, I may connect all of them. So, the supply chain has not to be integrated at one go. I've got 25 steps, integrate them one, and then we have a disaster. So I may go in a piecemeal. So that's the way advice is there. But again, some companies are well done. The people are well trained. They may do in a big bang around. This shows you another one, very simple one, particularly when you are doing the letter of issuance of the letter of credit to the final payment. So this ledger, when you look around the distributed ledger, there are around nine steps around. So this is starting from the exporter till the last one is the importer. You can see all the steps are there, including the import clearances, transportation, custom clearance, everything. Is there. And everything is very transparent. The goods are coming to the custom, they know very well. These items are on the way around. I don't have to show the document. Document is already available with them. So the blockchain ensures Transparency, transparency, and nobody can hamper this, tamper with this. Let me take the one more example on the procurement side. And procurement, typically I will do the public procurement first. I know there are many people today who are participating from various countries dealing with public procurement. And I'm also going to take up with, since I'm involved with government activities in India also, 
with Ministry of Finance, I'll take up this issue them with them also. If you look at the globally, the procurement sector is worth around $9.5 trillion worldwide. It's around 15% of the world GDP. So world GDP is around $60 trillion. And if you take 15% of that is $9.5 trillion. And somebody gave a wonderful analogy of this, that if you pile $1 notes, the 9.5 trillion will take from Earth to the moon and back. So that's the size of the transaction which happens in the public sector, under the public procurement. Now this money has a big potential and has big problems in developing countries. Data on public procurement remains undocumented and thus susceptible to corruption. As you know very well, this involves a lot of steps, starting from the bidding. The moment you issue the tender, there's a lot of steps involved around. Now, if I'm doing the bid part, I'm receiving the tenders, evaluating the tenders, who gets a contract, and everybody is connected in the ledger. I'm one of the suppliers for the government body, and I know very well my tender is there. Who are the other people in this chain? And I can also see the evaluation part, how much was my score. I think it will basically avoid corruption because then everybody is very well aware what they understand. Who got the business? How much score you got around? So the transparency, transparency, transparency. The whole digitization of public sector procurement, I think is one way to avoid the corruption. This icon shows you basically the moving of paper and money. So that corruption could be straight away cut down. I think today the problem in the public sector, if you look at the delivery time and this, is major reason is this one. So I feel the blockchain is a wonderful tool. It will bring a major change. Now, I call it the welcome because it is directly addressed the issues of providing transparency first, auditable because everybody is connected. If I'm in a public sector procurement, Audit is also part of the chain, they can audit it. From where it came, what prices it got, who are the suppliers, what code, what, I mean, whether their goods were meeting. I could have a smart contract there, which could checklist whose contracts are matching or not, whose specifications are matching or not. And it adds more trust. Today, we are all depending on a government machinery to evaluate our offers. Our trust is less. But if this becomes a blockchain, the trust adds up, corruption goes away. The benefits, if I look around broadly, obviously the users are empowered, who are connected, they are all empowered. This is what the government is talking around, empowering the masses, and this is how we are empowering the business people also. It improves the integrity, high data qualities, durability, longevity, transparencies, and then this intermediation and trust is exchange. Trust does exchange. That's what we do. Important is the way I look at it as a supply chain practitioners. The two things which excites me, one is the shared permission ledgers and immutable records of events. As you know in a supply chain, there are event after events. 20 steps, 30 steps, each is an event. And those events cannot, if our record cannot be changed. So for me, the bottom line is, the bottom line is this bottom blockchain is coming and it's very powerful. And this is a journey and we are all in the early days. The takeaway from this presentation, I will call blockchain is an ongoing revolution. Blockchain establishes a trust. Blockchain is for any domains. Blockchain is threatening any middle men or middle women actors around. So those who are middle persons, mediators, they're all being threatened. So many of the activity which are today growing in a big way, whether social media, this and that, they all could be threatened. The whole paradigm will shift once a blockchain is accepted in a big way. The blockchain will boost economic growth and prosperity. So take it that this is a wonderful tool, exciting tool, I would call it around. And this is how MIT came up. 
and MIT I gave a big trust factor, so they say blockchain technology redefining trust for a global digital economy. I know in India also we've been talking of digital, digital economy to cut corruption and black money. So MIT also says the blockchain will make us to move into the digital world. Well friend, with this I want to thank you all for your patient hearing. Again like last time, we have a big numbers. Thanks again for your patient hearing.